What's up everyone? Welcome back to another review and this time we're taking a look at Saw 6. I'm going to try and make this review as brief as humanly possible because Saw 6 throws so much at you and you're left just scratching your head confused. So, Saw 6 has got two parallel plots going on. Plot number one, an insurance executive must go through a series of deadly tests in order to save his employees. These tests are of course set up by Hoffman. Plot point number two, the FPI, particularly that of Erickson and Perez, yes, Perez, who was thought to have been dead in Saw 4, has now miraculously been resurrected. They're pretty much reopening the Jigsaw case because they do not think that Strom is the real Jigsaw accomplice. This, of course, now leads Offman to take measures to protect his identity and pretty much cover his ass. So much that happens in Saw 6 that it's really difficult to try and keep everything all in place, so I'm going to do my best to do that with this review. So I'm just going to talk about plot, plot point number one first, which follows the insurance executive. So there's this insurance executive who pre, he's pretty much in, he, he pretty much hands out like health insurance and stuff like that. So and this man also was the uh, policy was also handing out policies to that of John Kramer Jigsaw. And he just so happened to have denied policy to John, which has led this man named William Easton to not be put through the jigsaw test where he pretty much has to be tested on his compassion and to me I think this is actually much better handled as opposed to the fifth movie I think the stuff with William Easton is some of the strongest parts of the movie we see him in through flashbacks for interacting with interacting with his uh, clients as a real just he comes across as a heartless human being who almost doesn't care and he pretty much picks and chooses who he thinks should live and who he thinks should die and I like how that's pretty much flipped on him because now he's but he's being put through the test where he has to decide which of his employees should live or which of his employees should die and he's he's he has to make those difficult choices and you can see the anguish in his uh, in his uh, in his soul when he has to make those choices and I think the actor who played Peter, uh, who played William Easton, uh, Peter Outeridge, did a decent job at, play, at portraying the character with two different sides to his personality. We see the asshole side of his personality, but when his life is pretty much on the line, we see that he does have a compassionate side, and it, he does feel remorse and feel sorrow for the things that he's done because now it's happening to him. So he, he pretty much, he's pretty much learning his lesson, so to speak. So I thought all that stuff with him was handled. I'm going to say, it was handled fine. It's actually my favorite part of the movie is the, stuff, is the stuff with William Easton. And the flashbacks he has with John Kramer developing their re their relationship and developing why Kramer chose him for the Deadly Game since it was Easton who denied Kramer his medical coverage while he had his cancer. Cause <clears throat> and, of course, in those flashback scenes, Tobin Bell, as always, does a great performance. He was, he was fine. And you can tell these movies sorely miss, miss him as a more physical presence because he is needed desperately. Now, let's move on to plot point number two because so much happens in plot point number two. Perez is alive and the excuse for her being alive is very, very flimsy. They pretty much kept it a secret because Erickson did not know who, who he could and who he couldn't trust. Okay, the movie wants, to, the movie wants you to just give it that. And you're either going to or you're not. Me, personally, listen. You ended up killing Perez at the end of this movie anyway, so you might as well have just kept her dead and have Strom still be alive. So, yes. Perez being alive, I'm sorry, I don't like it. I don't like it, because you just killed her off anyway at the end, so what was the, big, what was the, whole, the whole twist of her being alive? It was kind of useless if you're just going to kill her. Makes, no, makes absolutely zero sense to me. Uh... Now, their investigation into trying to uncover the real truth of the accomplice, I thought that stuff was handled okay. And I like how Hoffman is constantly trying to cover up his tracks the best way he can until you finally get to the end where it goes back to the where it goes back to his murder of Seth, of Seth Baxter where they uncover the fact that he used a voice modulator to disguise his voice and that's how they're able to pretty much discover that, you know, Hoffman was the real accomplice. And of course, Hoffman pretty much kills Erickson and like I said he kills Perez and he pretty much sets them on fire to cover his tracks now in plot point number 6000 you got Jill Tuck who in the last movie was given this black box 
And it's revealed in this movie that these black boxes, that this black box had like seven different envelopes. And we don't, I, I the movie maybe explained what the contents of the envelopes were. I really don't know because I was trying to piece everything in my head and I just got tired trying to keep track of everything. But she does, but yeah, her whole, the whole thing was that I, uh, I think John didn't really fully trust Hoffman or something like that. And he pretty much had contingency plans put in place in case Hoffman were to go rogue, which Hoffman has eventually gone rogue, to the point where he actually subtly threatens Jill's life. Which leads to Jill to make an important drop-off at a hospital. Now, we all know who she made the drop-off to, and when we get to solve the final chapter, we'll talk about that. But that's where that plot point ends. And it's also revealed at the end that uh, she, oh yeah, at the end of the movie, she uh, shocks Hoffman, puts the bear trap on him, though Hoffman survives, but is facially disfigured. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say. And, plus, and there's a lot of retconning in this movie. So this movie expanded the idea of the Cecil, the man who killed the unborn child of Gideon. We find out that Amanda was with him the entire time, adding another layer of context to Amanda's relationship with Jigsaw. To tell you the truth, I would not have had Amanda there at all. It's already established in the first movie that she was a junkie. I don't really need to know why she was a junkie. She was a junkie. And through John Kramer, she was able to rehabilitate herself and become his first apprentice. Her already being there... What does it really add, to be honest with you? It doesn't really add much. Not only that, this movie also expanded on an idea that I was actually kind of liking, which is the idea of Hoffman and Amanda kind of having a civil rivalry with one another, trying to get the effect, trying to get the, uh, the affection of John as to who could be the better accomplice. The movie kind of expanded on that a little bit. I would have liked to have seen a lot more. To tell you the truth, I think a whole movie of Amanda and Hoffman one-upping one another would have been much more fascinating and interesting than this stuff. This stuff is just flat out confusing. But yeah, that's 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 how I feel about that. Uh, the directing in this movie is okay. It's nothing spectacular. The gore, I mean, the uh, the kills are pretty inventive. There's this, there's this one thing where these guys are like on a carousel, and as it's a gun that's on a timer, and Easton has to pretty much scar himself in order to save these people. However. Out of the six, two of them are going to live, which two of them eventually do live. So I thought that was fun. Uh, there is this, also this pretty cool scene where he's trying to guide this woman through steaming pipes, and it's revealed that a key is inside uh, uh, inside um, Will himself, so he has to kill her in self-defense. And there's also this subplot of this family who he denied coverage to, which led to his, which led to their, uh, which led to the father slash husband of this family dying from cancer and of course at the end of the movie they pretty much kill Easton in revenge the whole problem with Saw is that these people are supposed to learn things this family didn't learn a thing instead of going the route of compassion for Easton they just said no you're going to be tried and you're going to die and he dies and he dies in front of his sister no less who is also a scumbag person because she's a sensationalist journalist and she watches in horror as her brother is killed and died from acid. But the reporter character, character is completely and utterly useless, in my opinion. She doesn't really add much to the plot at all. You could have taken her out. We still had the same movie. Um, hell, you could have taken out the family that was denied coverage. You still would have had the same movie, to be honest with you. Because nothing really changes if you don't. And like I said, I think this movie would have been much more interesting if Strom was in it. And it's and it's Strom and Erickson who are hunting down, who are hunting down Hoffman instead of resurrecting Perez for no reason. So yeah, in some ways I think Saw Six is better than Saw Five, but in other ways I think Saw Six is just as stupid and dumb in a lot of ways as well, which is why Saw Six for me gets a four out of ten. It's overly convoluted. It's too plotty, and after a while, I'm done scratching my head in confusion. Four out, of si four out of ten for Saw 6. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Like the video and subscribe. And I'll see you all next time.